There is much debate about the end times. Do they truly exist? Are we living in that period? What is the true value of the end times? Many prophets and preachers claim that the world is in the end times. Others argue that Jesus and his disciples mentioned the end times 2,000 years ago. But look at us now. We're still here. No end times. No rapture. No kingdom of God. So what is really happening? Are we in the end times or not? Join us as we unveil what is the true meaning of the end times in Jesus' words. Why did Jesus say he's coming back soon when it's been so long? The last book of the Bible begins with the curious and inspiring sentence, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. The third sentence includes, For the time is near. Just as amazing are the last recorded words of Jesus at the end of the book, Surely I am coming soon. Jesus instructed all of his followers to be perpetually ready for his return, as in Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. God clearly presents the Lord's return as imminent. Why then, has he not returned after more than 2,000 years since his visible departure from the Mount of Olives? Jesus said he was coming soon. So what does soon mean? We're going to outline two reasons that we believe Jesus told us. His reappearance to earth would happen quickly. The first reason you may find to be less riveting than the second, but it needs to be pointed out. God is timeless. He exists completely independent of time because he is the creator of time. To God, as the Bible says, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Mathematics enters into the picture. We need to grasp that infinity is not a number, but rather the concept that there is no last number. We can count and count and count, but there is always the possibility to add another number. Maybe we don't have a name for the number because it is so distant, but the number still exists. This concept of infinity or boundlessness helps us understand God. Whether we look backward in time or forward in time, He exists. There is never a point that He didn't exist, even before creation. Psalm 92 declares, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If you tried to tell the number three to imagine what it feels like to be as far away on the number line as five million, He could hardly conceive of it. But try asking three to keep traveling forever until he reaches infinity, and he can't. He will never reach infinity. And neither can we grasp timelessness, the infinite nature of God. For God to tell us that his return is soon may not mean what we take for granted on our time scale. Perhaps that's exactly why the Bible proclaims in 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness. We tend to perceive His timing from our limited perspective, but God is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God has a divine and timeless perspective with a heart toward salvation. Nonetheless, Jesus did tell us finite humans that He is coming soon, with the backdrop of his timelessness, we still seek to understand his reason for using the term knowing our limited nature. Let's then discuss the second fascinating reason God may have expressed himself this way. If an exasperated mom wants her child to get out the door to an appointment for which they are already late because the child has been dilly-dallying for 20 minutes, the mom may exclaim, get over here, we must leave soon. In this case, when the mother says, soon, she means right now. If a dad wants his teen to get serious about studying for his permit for a driver's license, the father might firmly remind his son two months before his eligibility date. You better be preparing for your permit test, you'll be taking it very soon. In this case, when the dad says, soon, he means, in a couple of months. If a mother is trying to foster preparedness in her daughter, she might say to her, while the teen is still a high school freshman, 
take your classes seriously because you'll be going to college soon. In this case, when the mom says soon, she means in four years. Soon must be applied in context. In the first scenario with the distracted child, it is interpreted as in that very minute, whereas in the second case, it implies a more distant time down the road. However, the third college situation is the one in which the most planning is needed. Many years of serious study and responsibility are necessary to reach the goal. In the last case, soon calls us to recognize that much preparation must be made because the coming event is elaborate and weighty. Jesus tells us that he is coming quickly because his coming is the most important thing in the universe, the one event for which each Christian is aiming. Everything we do and say and are is invested in the eternal future to which he will usher us when he returns. The one event we cannot miss and must not be ill-prepared for is the coming of Jesus Christ to earth again to remake this broken, sinful world into his perfect kingdom. His reappearance could be immediate, this very minute. It could happen this year. It could also happen in hundreds or thousands of years. In any case, our knowing that it is soon is utterly appropriate, because this is the event to end all events. This is the hope of every believer. This is the one thing for which you want to say, I am ready. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The event may not occur soon. When it does, it will be sudden. This coming is still in our future sometime, thousands of years after these scriptures were written. Now, even though in our natural minds we interpret these scriptures to mean that Jesus would come back in a short time period, there are still many who believe that he hasn't yet. So, how do they explain these scriptures? One way is like this. The idea is not that the event may occur soon, but when it does, it will be sudden. So, in other words, when the above scriptures say soon to some, it doesn't literally mean soon. It means suddenly. So, Revelation 3.11 would actually mean this. I am coming suddenly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. It could be explained like this. We don't know when he'll come, but when he does, it will be suddenly and swift. After all, saying, I am coming soon is indeed actually different from saying, I am coming suddenly. In the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord tells us, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Understanding the surrounding context of this passage can be the catalyst to understanding the overall meaning of Jesus' words. Jesus is talking with his disciples about the destruction of the temple and the events of the future. The destruction of the temple was fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple. While this aspect of Matthew 24 has already been fulfilled, Jesus' second coming has not yet occurred. Much of Matthew 24 is referring to the second coming of Christ. Jesus' first advent into the world took place over 2,000 years ago, yet nobody knows when his second coming will return, except the Father. As Jesus explains in this passage of Scripture, nobody knows when the second coming will be, except the Father. The Lord himself didn't know when the second coming would occur, because only the Father is to know. When the Lord tells us, no one knows the day or the hour. He is referring to the truth that nobody knows when his second coming will be. Many individuals throughout time have tried to predict the second coming of Christ, yet there is no way a person can predict the Lord's second coming. The second coming of Christ is often confused with the rapture of the church. Many scholars blend these two events of eschatology to be the same event, However, the second coming of Christ and the rapture are two distinct events. The rapture will occur before the second coming of Christ, because the second coming will not occur until the end of the seven-year tribulation. 
None of us can predict the time when all of these future events will take place. The rapture is the catalyst for the rest of the events of eschatology as believers will be taken up to be with the Lord prior to the seven-year tribulation. After the seven-year tribulation will be the second coming of Christ. During this time, Christ will return to fight in the Battle of Armageddon. You can read Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 16 for more. In the Battle of Armageddon, the Lord will defeat the Antichrist and the false prophet. Jesus will rule victorious over evil and destroy all those who went against him. The second coming will be drastically different from his first coming. Hebrews 9.28 tells us, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. There is a leader who arises within the church and turns away from God, posing as a faithful shepherd while harboring harmful intentions. Antichrist plays an important role in both the physical and spiritual worlds. This guy pretending to be a wise figure offering different paths to salvation. One clear sign of the Antichrist's influence is the rise of secularism and the rejection of God's moral values. People are becoming more focused on themselves, putting their wants first, and often ignoring the well-being of others. This self-centered attitude goes against Jesus' teachings of love and selflessness. This coming world leader, the Antichrist, will come at an economically difficult time. There will be war in different parts of the world, and he, through brilliant political moves along with an incredible charisma, will be able to do what no one else has ever done. Bring economic stability to the world's monetary system and bring world peace. By establishing this peace, he will deceive many. He Everything in the Bible will happen just as God tells us it will. At the very end of all things, the Lord will restore all of his children to live with him in the perfect paradise. Let this truth encourage your heart today. Thus, when the Lord tells us, no one knows the day or hour, he is referring to the truth that nobody can know the timing of his second coming. Even though many have tried to predict the Lord's second coming, there is no way to accurately predict the second coming. As Christians, we can patiently wait for this day and pray for its coming. There are major events of eschatology that will occur in the future, but these fascinating events must not blind us to the point that we forget our responsibility now to share the gospel and help others come to know the Lord. By sharing the gospel and helping others to know Christ, we are slowly helping to advance God's kingdom and help more individuals to come to know Christ as their Savior and Lord, to be with Him in heaven. Behold, I am coming soon. Now let's talk and analyze Revelation 22, Art 6, 15. We've come to John's closing remarks in Revelation. Some have called it John's epilogue. It has a lot in common with the way Revelation opens. Verses 6 to 20 form the opposite bookend to chapter 1. Let's start with the reliability of John's testimony. The same angel who showed John the New Jerusalem now emphasizes the reliability of God's message to John. Verse 6. These words are trustworthy and true. He emphasized this before after describing the new creation. In 21.5 he said, These words are trustworthy and true. But in our passage, the angel includes language that started the book in 1.1.3. There too God sends his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Then, here in verse 7, he also mentions the words of the prophecy of this book, meaning the angel now has the whole book in view when he describes its reliability. All the revelation is trustworthy and true. In Revelation, we meet all kinds of deceivers. In 12.9, the dragon is the deceiver of the whole world. In 13.14, the false prophet deceives those who dwell on the earth. In 18.23, all nations are deceived by Babylon's sorcery. In 2.2, some were calling themselves apostles, but really they were false. In 3.9, some claimed to be Jews, but their opposition to Jesus exposes them as liars. So John paints a world where deception is the norm among the nations. We swim in a world of deception. 
but these words originate with God in heaven. In 610, those in heaven know that God is holy and true. In 153, they witness how God's ways are just and true. When God sends his son into the world, Jesus is called the faithful and true witness. But even more, God's revelation has forged link after link with the scriptures of old. And those scriptures reveal God's track record. Think of Joshua 21, 45. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Later, David would say, This God his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. The whole congregation sings in Psalm 111, 7. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. The words given to John are consistent with God's character. He is trustworthy. They are also consistent with Jesus' sovereignty over history. In verse 13, Jesus says of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God uses this title to distinguish himself from the nations and their idols. The nations and their idols lack any power to determine the future. But God, who is the first and the last, not only knows the future before it takes place, he creates the future by his sovereign word. Amazingly, though, Jesus takes this title to himself, meaning that God's plans for history transpire through the person of Jesus. He will make them happen. These words are trustworthy and true because nobody can stop the risen, sovereign Jesus. But there's another reason these words are trustworthy. God is fulfilling them in history. For example, take the last few words of verse 6. God sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. That's from Daniel 2. Daniel sees four kingdoms eventually replaced by the kingdom of God's Messiah, like a mountain covering the earth. Those four kingdoms include Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, all rising and falling in that order. John writes under Roman rule, and sometimes he draws connections to how Rome is one manifestation of the beast. But John also sees Jesus reigning from a great mountain. In other words, the message John receives aligns with Daniel's prophecy, most of which had already seen its fulfillment in history and is being fulfilled in John's day as part of Jesus' resurrection victory. Here's another reason to trust John's testimony. The goal of his prophecy is the worship of God. In Scripture, a true prophet was measured by whether they directed people to worship and obey God. Deuteronomy 13.1 If a prophet gives you a sign or a wonder and then says, Let us go after other gods and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet. Matthew 7.15 Jesus says that you will recognize a false prophet by their fruits, if John gave us these visions to distract us from the true worship of God, then we'd know that his message is false. But that's not what he does. No, notice the integrity of John's witness in verses 8 to 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Why does John include this? Twice now. It happened in 1910 as well. The angel has to tell him, Stop! Worship God! The point is to show the focus of proper worship. John openly acknowledges how easy it is for even him to get the focus of worship wrong, which also shows the integrity of John's message. John is a true prophet. His message stresses the need for our worship to center upon God alone, and he's willing to tell you when he needs correction. Considering all these things together then, Revelation is a reliable testimony. God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. One reason Jesus has not yet returned is that he is waiting for more people to come to faith in him. The word repentance implies a change of mind about sin and its solution. 
people must admit they are sinners and need a solution outside of themselves. As a result, they turn to Christ in faith, the flip side of repentance, trusting His work on the cross and His resurrection as the basis for their salvation. Without that, the alternative is to perish, a word signifying the horrible destiny of those who never make peace with God. And He may wait for you also. But a day is coming when the wait will be over, when Jesus returns. Are you ready for that day? Have you made peace with God by trusting Jesus as your Savior? The Bible had predicted, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with His hand the remnant of His people, and assemble the banished ones of Israel, and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. But since, with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day, we could be kept waiting. Nevertheless, whether it happens in 2024 or not, all of us benefit from knowing as much as we can about His return and prophecy, because blessed is He who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. You need to understand Bible prophecy so you will recognize what is happening in the world and will know how you can escape from the trouble ahead and well prepare for that day. Signs of the End Times Instead of waiting hopelessly and gradually wearing down your faith, the best approach is to focus on observing your surroundings. Perhaps what is happening around you is the clearest sign that the end times are coming very soon. The first sign that we need to be watching for is the increase in false prophets. Why is it that fake prophets are increasing currently? The answer is that we are at the end of time. Jesus prophesied the era of fake prophets. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. They hate light. They love darkness. Until you know and accept the truth, you will remain in the net of fake prophets. Fake prophets are on the increase as Satan releases them to the world to fight the church with deceit. In case you do not know, fake prophets are the agents that Satan is using to fight the body of Christ, and the weapon they are using is deceit. False prophets are increasing. Those who were once genuine prophets have turned to fake prophets because of making money. The havoc of fake prophets on the church affects the salvation of the upright. Satan is using them to destroy the salvation of those who are already saved in the church. Imagine the number of people who have lost their salvation at the hands of fake prophets because of the wounds brought upon them. Also, they cause serious confusion in the world. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Satan is using fake prophets to confuse the world by empowering them to see visions and perform fake miracles. Henceforth, do not bind yourself to the visions and fake miracles of fake prophets, rather come to the visions of the Lord. Moreover, they uproot faith from the heart of people. Satan is using fake prophets to uproot faith from the minds of people and plant fear in them. This is why their prophecies and visions are always fearful. Furthermore, they discourage people from accepting Christ. The bad lifestyle of fake prophets brings discouragement to those who have accepted Christ and prevents those who are yet to how to break the net of fake prophets. The second sign is the increase of earthquakes. The earthquake on New Year's Day in Japan served as a warning of an uneasy 2024, and indeed it was. In just the first six months of 2024, thousands of earthquakes, both large and small, have occurred all over the world. Recently, New Jersey was hit with the most powerful tembler to shake the Garden State in 241 years. This earthquake in New Jersey rattled New York City and the surrounding area. 
These consecutive earthquakes might be referenced the prophecies about the end times that Jesus handed down in the Gospels. The kingdom of heaven will come in a time when there will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Jesus also notes that there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars as well. Let's take a look at this verse. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. It's hard to ignore the biblical undertones. After the earth shook, some said the confluence of natural perturbances was evidence of a higher power, a warning that the worst was yet to come. The book of Revelation mentions earthquakes quite a lot. For example, in chapter 8, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And later, in chapter 16, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. The Bible's prophecy about earthquakes alerts us to what will take place in the near future. Jesus said, When you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. The Bible explains that the kingdom of God is a real government in heaven with Jesus Christ as king. This kingdom is the one that Jesus taught his followers to pray for. When God's kingdom rules over the earth, God will prevent natural disasters, including earthquakes, from harming people. What is more, he will undo the physical and emotional harm caused by today's earthquakes. If anything, they might also be received as reminders that our lives, our world, our universe are all finite and will end at some point, and that we should always be spiritually prepared for a new heaven and a new earth where all disasters will be gone and perfect peace and harmony with God will be enjoyed by all who have been faithful to Him. The third sign that we are seeing and it's happening right now is the increase in cold love. When you read these verses, what pops up in your mind? Matthew 24, 10, 12. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Technology, while it has caused some good, has definitely brought some bad with it. This seems to be one of the main reasons causing people's love for one another to wax cold. 1 Corinthians 13.2 tells us exactly how we need to go about all of this. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. The effect of this coldness is that the brother betrays the brother. Matthew 24.10 Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. That hate is the final outcome of hypocritical love. Just the shell of love where the warmth has gone out and ice has come in. And the upshot is no longer just hypocritical love, but rather hate that betrays brother to brother. Jesus says that the reason for this upsurge of cold, hypocritical love that eventually betrays a brother is owing to the increase of lawlessness. That's worth thinking about because you might want to turn it around like this. Because love grew cold, there's a lot of lawlessness. The root of this growing coldness of love in the church toward each other is a deep hostility to authority. That's my interpretation of lawlessness, a deep hostility to authority, especially God's authority. That's what lawlessness is at root. I will not submit to law from outside my sovereign self. I'm not going to yield to authority anymore. Since cold love, Jesus says, comes from the increase of lawlessness, we must fight upstream, so to speak, from the river of love. We've got to get up there to the springs. We must fight against arrogance and pride and self-sufficiency. That is, against the spirit of lawlessness in our hearts that says, I will not submit. I don't like people telling me what to do, least of all, an omnipotent God. 
Lawlessness means we want to be our own law. We don't want anybody, especially an infallible, omnipotent God, telling us what to do. We want to create our own meaning, create our own identity, create our own rules. And when this happens, we have cut ourselves off from Christ and from the Holy Spirit, and therefore from love.